people that I know. <laughs> um, uh, we also have, uh, we're, we're live streaming uh, the entire event uh, uh, in a partnership between a lot of the resources here at York. So thanks to the crew at LTS and also it's going out through HowlRound uh, so that it uh, reaches uh, fairly far. And people, this is meant to be it was sort of when we envisioned these symposiums, uh, they were meant to be sort of casual conversations updating on the projects. And because there was so much interest in this one, uh, the space that we, that we went for was the, this large space, uh, which is exciting that there's that much interest in, in these sort of things coming together. But it's also meant to be casual, so though it is in a formal theatrical space, uh, feel free to come and go. You can't bring coffee and food into the venue here. Um, but we have ample coffee breaks. It's meant to be a leisurely day for conversation and things like that. I did want to uh, start out um, with uh, with our with our, our land acknowledgement um, and add a little bit of detail actually uh, to it as well. So uh, we do recognize that. Uh, there are many nations that have uh, long-standing relationships with the territories and areas on which the York campus uh, sits. Uh, this, this area has uh, been under the care of the Anishabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, and the Metis, um, and is currently home to lots of indigenous people. Um, this isn't a necessarily a historical statement. Uh, we acknowledge the, the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Um, I wanted to add a little bit of detail because uh, I know that when I hear these land acknowledgements, I also like a little bit of support. So uh, I put a map up on up on the screen. Um, I'm going to make a plug for an excellent resource if you're ever wondering uh, whose land you're on for native-earth.ca. They also have a wonderful mobile app, which you'll perhaps understand. Uh, uh, one of the reasons that I'm a big fan of it, once we get through a number of the projects here, I'm very interested in space and geography. Um, but looking at that, it's also a great online uh, resource. This is a, a, a map of the GTA. Um, but also, uh, you can see how these, these traditional territories sort of overlap in this, in this area here. And we can, you can, it's a little bit small there, but you can see um, where these, these traditional na uh, nations have overlapped in uh, stewarding the land around here, and also where the, where the treaties are. So if you're ever interested in, in knowing uh, whose land you're on, it's an excellent resource. It's community developed and it's ever changing um, as it has more, uh, more detail in it, but uh, taking a look at the, the traditional territories and the treaties is interesting. I did also want to make a couple of plugs um, for, uh, for some local uh, indigenous um, uh, artists and events that are coming up just in the next month. Wasatochak uh, is having its 32nd iteration. Uh, it's a festival of new and developing work that, that's uh, uh, put on by uh, Native Earth. I, was, I keep say, uh, saying Native Land and I keep reversing the two of them. But uh, Native Earth, uh, that's going to be coming up later in the month. Um, I also want to make a s specific plug uh, on Friday, November 22nd, and he's, uh, uh, they're also going to be in the Two-Spirit Cabaret, but uh, Dakota Alicantra uh, Camacho, uh, because uh, one of the projects that we're going to be looking at today, Groundworks, is sort of related to another Dancing Earth Creations project uh, called uh, Between Underground and Skyworld, and they're in the cast for that as well. So I thought that that was a nice way to making the connection there. Uh, also, there's an initiative that's uh, been started that, that has a bit of an academic home here at York called the Climate Change Theater Action. And uh, I co-direct that uh, with a collaborator named Chantal Bilodeau. And there's a number of uh, indigenous playwrights that are contributing work to that. And part of the festival will also be reading specifically those plays in there. And then I also wanted to plug later in the month, we're going to, uh, here at York, um, there will be uh, a symposium on indigenous environmental justice that will be here. So if you're interested in getting more involved with uh, a number of these issues and, and, and connecting to the land in that way, there's a number of opportunities there that are coming up just in, the, in this month. And if you're, especially if you're at Wissaka Jack, I'll see you there. Uh, that being said, I wanted to welcome Joel Ong up to the stage to talk a little bit about what Sensorium is. We've been, uh, each of these symposia is going to be connected with um, 
a university where we've got some partners there or are local to various projects that we're working on, and we've been really fortunate to have uh, this relationship with Sensorium. So I'll turn it over to you, Joel. Hi, Ronan. Um, I have a little kind of, it's not really a speech, but just some brief notes um, that I'd like to share, actually. Um, my name is Joel Ong. Uh, I'm an assistant professor in computational arts here at uh, School of the Arts, Media Performance and Design. And uh, I'm also the interim director for, Sens uh, for Sensorium, uh, which is our faculty research unit in digital art and technology. And on behalf of Sensorium and um, its executive committee, uh, as well as the associate director in research, um, I would like to thank Ian and Justin and Tosa Lab for inviting us to be partners in this event and also to, uh, in initiating such a wonderful series of events that will provide um, our faculty and students exposure to the processes and innovations in artistic practices around mixed reality. So some of the brief thoughts that I had, right, um, around mixed reality. Um, as an ecologist by training, uh, I think of mixed reality in somewhat um, a different way as one might today. Um, indeed, an ecology of any given environment already consists of multiple realities mixed uh, and mashed together in a field of interactions and energy transfers. Multiple species coexist uh, and evolve together and into each other, responding and communicating uh, with the environments as they do. Um, and where these are most potently explored are um, at the liminal zones between ecosystems, uh, these edges where organisms move fluently, um, freely adapting to the behavioral and semiotic structures on each side. And they've been doing this for a really long time, obviously. Uh, these edge effects are the reasons um, why the Earth became and has remained habitable. Of course, and in the human, and these become geopolitical events. You know, stage invasions, species migrations, boundary transgressions, and associated anthropogenic pushbacks. Of course, this is one example amongst many today where the uh, inability for us to understand another species' worldview or umwelt has pr produced undesirable effects. In this sense, then, um, mixed reality for an ecologist really represents a sort of failed equilibrium, and it's a source of despair. Um, However, a large part of the environmental humanities today revolves around um, a rediscovery or redefinition of what wild or wilderness is. Um, and in our futile um, search for feral places and things that are untouched or unmaimed by our hands, since everything, including the air um, we breathe, is a product of civilization, wildness becomes a concept then that, be, uh, that teaches us a way to see or to observe or to describe. Um, it becomes, as author Jack Turner describes, a nature literacy that is not rooted in place or circumstance, but in the concept of self, physical, psychological, and philosophical transformations. Something that exists deep in our evolutionary history that is immeasurable and beyond academic definition. Um, I posit it's a biology of wellness, really, that's the seed of our perception, our sensory apparatus, or our sensorium. So that's what we aspire um, to be here at the Research Center, aptly titled Sensorium, a uh, center for creative inquiry and experimentation in the digital arts, um, as a haven for outliers in the academic community here at York uh, who transition between disciplinary boundaries and engage in these departmental edge effects. If 100,000 flesh-eating zombies can reveal so much more about humanity, as in The Walking Dead, than regular documentary, may I venture to suggest that mixed reality and all its myriad shapes and forms, processes and technologies that will be described, of course, in the, in the course of today's events, will teach us more about what it means to be real, what it means to be natural, what it means to feel, to sense, to show empathy, um, to love. Mixed reality therefore becomes a site for productive frictions between the new and emerging and the emerging with the deeply centered wildness um, of creativity, imagination, and play. The technologies today and in Toaster Lab's Atelier series uh, will explore the cutting edge, the visuals and sounds and stimulus of today's fast growing um, aesthetic cultures. But add in the human, and these become productive frictions and moments for truly profound revelation. So on behalf of Sensorium and its associated faculty and graduate student members, uh, I thank you for bringing us into this process together and I look forward to the rest of the day's events. Thank you.
Thank you, Joel. Um, I'm going to welcome uh, the other two thirds of Toaster Lab to the stage, uh, Justine Garrett. And I was doing it wrong. Andrew Sampri. <laughs> uh, Andrew Sampri. Yes, I did it right this time. I know, I know. You'd, you'd hardly think that we work together on a regular basis. Uh, so we came together, what we wanted to do, and um, we're going to get a, a couple of mics and we're going to move over the seats here. We're, what we wanted to do in this, this sort of first bit uh, was to talk a little bit about uh, the origins of the way that we work and what we're working on, how the atelier came together, and then we'll sort of take us through to that, that first period. You're walking away from us with the mics. I know, here. Yeah, I think that we, we can, let's see. Can we sit over here? Yeah. yeah. Cool. We can still see the, the yeah, monitor there. Sure. So we, the history of Toaster Lab is that we came together in 2016. I keep saying 17, but that was sort of the first project that we worked, at the, that was the premiere of the first project that we did together, which will highlight a couple of the aspects to it here. The origins of how we became Toaster Lab as opposed to another name is that we needed a name to register a project under, and uh, it had for a while, I'd say a decade or more, been something of a, of a personal website. So that's sort of where the name came from, but it fits really well into what we're doing uh, of the logic there. Do you, do you feel differently, Andrew? You're making a face I don't feel differently, but I'm actually curious how, it, I wanna hear about how we're connected to Toast. <laughs> how it's connected to Toast. <laughs> I did not put an image of its origins and its relationship to Toast in this slideshow that we're about to show. Okay. Um, but I will explain that there was at one point uh, where uh, I made a thing out of a toaster and I just got really attached to the form of it. And so everything, like, if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at ToasterDog. I remember this now. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and so it was Toaster Lab because I just didn't want a vanity URL at the time. And then when we put together our first show and we needed to register it under something, the name stuck and has, has, has stuck. There will be multiple labs, only one toast though, uh, moving forward. So uh, what we do is place-based extended reality experiences. They take on a, a number of different forms. Um, there we go. Uh, so the three of us uh, each have different levels uh, or different areas of expertise and then different levels of knowledge within each other's sort of expertise base. Uh, my, uh, my area tends to be in the physical production and media production. Uh, so in terms of working with recorded media and then connecting it. Uh, Andrew, what do you do? So my focus is, uh, at least in this context, is mostly on the engineering aspect. Um, I am an artist, so I do. Uh, I used to do a lot more installation work, and then I moved into doing theater work and uh, digital sonography. Uh, but again, in the context of Toaster, I think I'm mostly handling the, the technology and the infrastructure back end. And my background is in um, creative writing and performance and narrative, but also in production management. So all of those things combined make Toaster Lab. Yeah, so we have a, we have a uh, co-governance model where we sort of work under unanimous decision making amongst the three of us. Uh, we also, uh, and then we'll get into the structure of the uh, atelier in just a moment. Um, so that's a, a little bit more. We each have our own individual practices. What's that? Oh yeah, look, it's us, there we are. Uh, Seen the for the first time. Yes. <laughs> Uh, so we each have these backgrounds that have these, um, these uh, areas of expertise that work together well and the, one of the hallmarks of the way that we end up developing projects is making sure that we're working together at each step of the way. Knowing that sometimes narrative and production uh, work together, production and any sort of development and coding need to work together and those all need to move together at one time because we've all been involved in projects in which um, one of those is leading or you've been delivered with one of those things and then I have to make something fit, nothing. And that's sort of outside of the way that, that we choose to work. Uh, so where, where this came together is that um, we were interested in sort of social mixed reality experiences, things that took people out of headsets. I, although there's a slide of a picture of someone in a headset here. Um, uh, we also uh, have been, in, to varying degrees, I, I'm, I'm more of an avid geocacher than anything else in this list here, but looking at uh, various types of place-based activities that you could do together and the explosion of that, especially with the addition of uh, Pokemon Go. Uh, Pokemon Go actually, like, 
was released in the middle of our first large project together and made all of our grant narratives about half as long. Uh, because when we started, we had to explain the mechanics of what became Pokemon Go in a very abstract way. We were like, Pokemon Go, but outer space and art. And people were like, I get it. <laughs> uh, but before that, they didn't necessarily. And then one of the things that this opens up an opportunity for are these like, Inter interwoven meta narrative. So a lot of the projects that we work on look uh, work across a number of different locations, uh, and uh, try and integrate like story into the place that we're in, and, and come into these extended universes, uh, which uh, in our in our own framework, not necessarily that we're working with any of this IP, but that in our own network that has led to some significantly sized undertakings, things. So. What we aim to do uh, as a company, as a production company, is to produce mixed reality content that delivers it through an original platform. A lot of the uh, code that is developed with the projects uh, is, is itself bespoke. Um, a lot of that, the responsibility of Andrew. Um, we want to take users on a hunt of the experience, so we're trying to guide people through additional space. Uh, there's always an element of gamification, to, well, maybe not always, but there's typically an element of gamification to that insofar as how somebody progresses through it and the logics of how somebody accumulates that experience when it's not, because we're all theater makers, uh, that it's not necessarily as clear as working through a theatrical experience from start to finish. Uh, that adds an enchanting digital overlay to life, uh, integrating original and novel tech, and bringing the audience into the place, right? Uh, so our first project together uh, was called Transmission, and this is before we actually knew that we were gonna be uh, a company. Like I said, we'd created more of an extended universe than necessarily one script. Uh, in the end, there were 13 hours of content, uh, involved in it. There was a, a live stage performance. We had done a lot of mixed reality production. Um, there was a couple of installations associated with it uh, that were tied to also some of that media. We had a companion podcast series, both in world and out of world that sort of transitioned over the, the course of its run. Uh, and then some additional events to that. What was, what, was, what was your experience like working on transmission? Well, I think taking some of our cues from maybe writing like a, a season of television was more what we were thinking of, but at the same time you could experience it all at once in and geolocated in the city. So that was the, it was just a really simple, like quick weekend project that we did to write 30 scenes. Just kidding, it was years and years of work. Yes. <laughs> and and that, that is, uh, uh, I know that it's up on the side, but this is to say that uh, all of this took place over 30 specific sites across the city of Edinburgh during the festival. It was part of the Future Play Festival in Edinburgh, and then we did a smaller version of it for the Future of Storytelling Festival in uh, New York on Staten Island. Andrew? Anything to add on to what it was like to do transmission? Um, so I came, uh, I, we met sort of after transmission, most of the creative uh, process was underway. Um, so for me, yeah, it was, I mean, it was a great project. I, I really enjoyed it, but it was definitely like, uh, you want to do what? Yeah. In, in what timeline? <laughs> Um, so, I mean, I, I think I literally flew in the week before the show and uh, sequestered myself in a room and uh, piled up a bunch of beer and coated. Um, <laughs> We've been doing but, some work I mean, before had, that. And it's not to say that there was no, nothing there, but it, it, um, it was, I think, uh, it, we'll talk about this in a bit, but it led uh, in part to sort of the, the plan that we have to try to create a, a long-term infrastructure mm -hmm. um, as opposed to uh, uh, the kind of like, oh my God, we need all this stuff right now, which is usually what happens no matter what. Right. Uh, and I don't mean to, to put that at the feet of Toaster Lab. I think that's common to a lot of art and tech projects. Um, but no, but the project itself was, was really nice. And actually, even, even that sort of uh, in the room working was, uh, was quite fun um, because we had other expertise in the space as well. So like I, the sound designer was staying across the uh, room from me, uh, across the hall. So at some point I realized we didn't actually have any sound in the app. So I just knocked on the door and I said, hey, I see you have a synthesizer here. <laughs> Um, and he composed the soundtrack. Uh, so it was actually, in that, in that respect, it was super fun. It was like rap summer camp for app. Right, <laughs> yeah. It becomes an, an interesting, like, butting up against what we think we can accomplish in theater and oftentimes can if it was very analog theater versus the limits like what you to can get away what with. you can get away with on the technology side I mean, as well. would I recommend doing this as your first project? 
Well, it, it seems like it worked out because here we are on a stage, so that's good. But it was, um, I think when you're kind of at the beginning of experimenting with new technology, and I think we'll hear a lot about that today, um, you're not sure what your own limits are, and then you kind of move past like the normal meet space limits of time and space, and then you just keep going and you end up with this like really ambitious large piece of art. Yeah, I'd say that it, it was probably, it's not, I wouldn't recommend doing this as your first project, but that's only if you realize that this is the project that you're doing when you commit to doing it. Uh, so a little bit of uh, the background to it, you can see sort of it was available in uh, various Apple stores. It was an, an iOS only still experience. There. It's still there. Uh, it has the New York content in it, though. It's the New York content in it, though. Yes, <laughs> which is fun. Uh, and so, uh, and you can still download the podcast. The podcast is actually really interesting. The first twelve episodes are actually just uh, it's topical conversations with space scientists. So, in the process of researching the project, we interviewed about eighteen different experts within various aspects of space science to like as the dramaturgical research uh, and re recorded a lot of them because they were at distance and turned it into a podcast and then turned it into an in-world discussion of moving ahead. Uh, you can take a look at some of the app here and you can see a little bit of the interface here. So we've got uh, in, the, in the lower corner there, one of the site-specific performances that happened in the windows of, which is also where we were staying. This is, this is efficiency running it as a theater project that people were sleeping but, uh, in these rooms, but from 7 to 8 p.m. Uh, on most nights, or 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. on most nights, there was a dance performance that you could watch in those windows as well. Um, but you can see here that there, uh, the main way that someone interfaced, or the, the two main ways that someone could interface with this experience was either being notified when they became proximate to something, or they could guide themselves around through a map. And we also would suggest various pathways that they could take. All of the content that was in it, not all of it, but uh, about half of the content, all of it's geolocated. About half of it is locked to a specific place in this experience, so that it was an experience that took place in a specific place, so that you had to go to that place to actually unlock it and access it. We had a few power users that went through yeah. everything. One of them involved a hike, not a not like a strenuous hike, but yeah. it, it took a while. Someone broke their ankle while we were trying to make to, to, that was, to build it. <laughs> Shh. <laughs> Uh, mixed reality is really hard, you guys. <laughs> the reality part of the mixed yeah. is hard. So there's a couple of different screenshots here of the mixture between uh, the uh, live, the recorded, pre-recorded, like archival footage that's there, and then a bunch of the, the 360 sort of VR experiences that were embedded within. And so uh, put, these, put these all together. Uh, so it sort of set up the way that we work. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we work with much more knowledge as to exactly how one of these projects comes together at this point. Uh, the funding for it was a combination of uh, research funding. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we had a bit of private investment, mm -hmm. some people who just like thought what we were doing was cool. Uh, public grants, there's some corporate partnerships and, uh, and ticket sales. So it was like a really, uh, insofar as an arts project, one of the weird things about it is that it was very small for a media project but it was massive for a live project, yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, people would engage with some part of it like 100 to 200 times a day based off of, one of the other interesting things that, that we learned about this is that we can actually get metrics over viewership because we were st streaming content or somebody had to download something. Mm -hmm. And so in addition to ticket sales, we're also like how many people and when are they watching individual pieces of content, which has informed a lot of the ways that we've been working. Um, and I mentioned the presentations that we had before. So what this led to was actually a relationship uh, between now two entities. I'm going to turn this over to you okay. to talk a little bit about Place Lab uh, and its relationship to Toaster Lab, just to make it more complicated. No worries. So I had actually prepped a very quick talk. Should I do that or should I yeah, just let's talk? Try. Okay, can I stand at the podium? Yes. You can stand at the I podium. Because I feel very weird doing this sitting. <laughs> we'll talk amongst ourselves. We'll sit here very supportingly. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, so my name is Andrew. Uh, I've been doing art and technology work for a long time, especially software development in creative mode. Um, in around 2009, I was working at IBM, and I started to obsess a bit about this new location feature that was popping up on web browsers, and especially iPhone apps. 
And I organized a conference called The Social and the Spatial. And the idea was to bring together a bunch of practitioners from different corners of the internet and from different types of practice. Uh, and my favorite folks who, who we brought there were people who were working in virtual worlds uh, and folks who were working in sound, who are trying to kind of bridge this conceptual space between the layers that we occupy online and the real world. Uh, one of the attendees, this is a plug, but one of the attendees is a sound artist who some of you might know named Halsey Burgund, uh, and he recently launched a project called AudioAR.org, which is a, a community catalog of resources related to audio augmented reality, and you should all check it out. Um, but fast forward a few years, I had done a collaborative film project called Hotel City, which was a film project where we took the content of film, sliced it up and put it on places on a map, and then the film actually recreated itself uh, through a geographic algorithm. So it would redraw different paths and then recomposite the story. Um, and then my partner Anandita and I uh, made an app called Summer of Darkness for the summer of 2016. Uh, which was the bicentennial of the year without summer. This was an unprecedented global uh, climate change incident. So there was a volcanic eruption, it completely changed the weather. And because of this, uh, Lord Byron and his entourage who were spending the summer on Lake uh, Geneva, which is actually where I live, um, were stuck inside. And so Byron challenged his compatriots to write a ghost story and that's when Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein. Um, so as a result of this project, which was an app-based project, I met Ian and then we collaborated on transmission, which we just talked about. Um, so then around this time, basically Ian and Justine and Anandita and I were just geeking out about doing location-based work, um, how interesting this was, how we could tell stories differently. And I was also taking a look at some of what we just discussed, the technical effort on a lot of these projects. And I was seeing from my own side a lot of duplication, like I was solving the same problem in these different projects over and over again in slightly different ways. Um, and also there was some, there, there, there are many issues, but there's also the scaling issue that Ian mentioned where a lot of these projects would be like way too small to be a media project or way too small for an app project, but way too large for a fringe type theater project. Um, and I also, uh, I do make my own work, but here and in most of my collaboration, I find myself in an engineering role. And if you've ever done that, you know how difficult it can be to mentally switch from kind of like, I need to solve these technical engineering problems and then, oh yeah, there's a dramaturgical thing that we need to do. And it's because the pace of this work is different. The way that it actually needs to come about is, is at different time, timelines. Um, so in order to fix this problem, um, we need to have some kind of a longitudinal effort, some sort of a sustained long-term development work to try to create a set of frameworks, to try to create uh, software um, or uh, technologies and, and um, what's the word I'm looking for, best practices that will allow us to kind of solve these problems uh, at the speed of aesthetic composition. And that's really the end goal. That's a really hard problem. So how do we actually scope this down? And we thought that maybe we could do this in one particular area, which was to try to figure out a way to create some sustained long-term development work around tools for creating geographic stories. And that's the reason, this is the long story, for The Place Lab, which is a company that uh, founded with myself and my partner Anandita, and we're focused on creating these tools. Um, the strategy specifically is to try to keep up this development pace by producing one single code base with a maximally permissive open source license so that we can reuse the techniques across different projects. And the key part here technically is that the emphasis is on reusable code and infrastructure. So we're not trying to create a platform like Twitter or Layer or YouTube. We're not trying to create a container into which people can put things, but rather create a bunch of stuff and scaffolding that you can just use and make your own projects. Um, the very first project here, and I'm wrapping up, is a tool that is creatively called the Map Tool. Um, it's a kind of Swiss Army knife uh, for creating these experiences of media on a map. We're handling the composition of the map, the collection, the packaging, and the serving of the media to mobile devices, and the next step we're working on creating a rule set around how this media gets played back depending on local conditions. Um, ultimately, we'll also have a set of example code for how you can consume this on the web on Android and iOS. Um, and it's tricky work because creating reusable anything is many times harder than creating a one-off. But we're trying to drive this this way and using uh, especially the Atelier projects, if not as uh, direct um, use cases, at least conceptually. So there's a lot of times that Ian and I will sit down and talk through these projects and say, okay, what's in common here? What could we actually build out that would, that would support this? Um, in the end, my hope is to solve some of the issues that Adrian and I were talking about on the way over. Adrian's from Swim Pony, and you'll hear from her later. Uh, where we create a whole project, an art project, and we love it, and we see it, and we go, yeah, that was a great first draft, I wanna do it again. Um, so that's me, and that's Place Lab. Thank you. Um, and it, there's a, you deserve the applause. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, I lost my mic. Yeah, where'd your mic go? That's okay, uh, here it comes. Thank you, Scott. Thank you very much. 
Um, an interesting point that I just want to like pull out of there is in so far as this question of scale is that when we got to the end of transmission and we sort of realized what we had actually um, committed ourselves to in making this project, there's a conversation of like what's next and how do we work with this again and how do we fund that? Sure. Um, and part of that became uh, a conversation or a difference between working from project to project, which is sort of how we started, um, moving into what is now the Atelier project, and then a couple of conversations we had on more of a, although the, uh, those who we talked to would say that they are not venture capitalists, but that somebody was like, oh, so you're gonna make a platform for delivering AR content that's like scalable like YouTube, and we're like, but we're artists. And they said, well, yeah, but you know, when you, you make some case studies and then you'll have the platform and then you'll be rich and you'll do whatever you want. And I was like, eh, I just wanna make the thing. I don't wanna, I don't wanna run a company uh, of that, like that. Um, which is maybe not the, some people will think that that was a foolish choice. It so far has worked out for us. No, no. I think that that's part of how we find each of ourselves in the position that we're in individually and collectively. So what is the Atelier, uh, and what are we here to talk about uh, today? So we're doing this two-year deep dive. Uh, it sort of, we it kicked it off in June of, uh, of this last year in sort of a, a co-presented panel between where we were all working at the time in Prague as part of the Prague Quadrennial. Um, and you'll actually see some work from that uh, a little bit later uh, today. And FOLDA, the Festival of Live Digital Art, which takes place, uh, it's put together by Spiderweb Show and takes place on the Queen's University campus in Kingston. Um, and uh, in, in forming this partnership, we launched a project there and then wanted to essentially work through this process of like holding up ideas or, or boosting other performance projects and providing the capacity, recognizing that within a lot of performance projects that uh, whenever you add in another department, that's hard, like those are hard to scale as well because there's not necessarily the thought of what exactly that is and it's hard to picture. So what if we were able to come in and say like, we have these goals of developing these tools, we need case studies to be able to do that. Uh, also, if there's somebody who's interested in that coming together, uh, then how can we support them in actually realizing that work? So we've committed over the, the course of this two years, culminating in our final report out will be in, uh, uh, in June of 2021 with as many projects as possible presented at World Stage Design in Calgary in August of 2021. And that each of those will be working through roughly 18 of those. Uh, so this is a list of our current projects that we're working on right now. Um, we'll hear from all of these in some fashion today um, to update here. Uh, so we sort of came in to start the project with some things that we're already uh, working with, but they're sort of all over the place taking different approaches to the way that um, things come together. Uh, just a couple of shots that you'll probably see some of later. Um, we've been, this is as part of the Groundworks project that we've been working on uh, with communities in Northern California. Uh, we've been climbing mountains and going to acorn gathering sites with our VR cameras. Uh, this is over in, in North York. This is our Parkway Forest project, uh, which we created a web app for youth to create um, small VR films, and then uh, presented that, uh, not this last summer, but the previous summer, uh, back to the community and looking at continuing to develop this uh, as well, as one of the first implementations, I think, of Toaster Lab of the actual map tool is also part of that. It's still the beta. It's still, it's still it's technically it's the, beta. the beta, yeah. Code, yeah. yeah. Um, and then uh, there'll be much more detail in, uh, in Adrian Mackey's presentation on our, pro our collaboration with Swim Pony, which is a uh, location-driven audio project that's happening around the, um, uh, along trails along in the watershed area around Philadelphia. So one of the other things that we did in, in addition to starting to provide the capacity for this was also how do we bring in the expertise either because they have technical expertise or production expertise. So we've put together an advisory board uh, that consults on our project. Most of them are here today. Um, there's a couple of people who can't be with us. Um, so we'll be introducing people throughout the day. Uh, Beth Gates will actually be presenting remotely, but otherwise uh, Ellie Jessup is very pregnant right now and so can't travel, so she can't join us today. And uh, Sydney Skybetter also has some, uh, uh, and Patrick also Rosati. Pregnant, just no, they both have par parenting responsibilities that prevent them from being with us today. But we'll actually hear from everybody else uh, today as well. So this also became our first opportunity to pull together everybody, uh, as many people as possible in 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 person, because people are scattered throughout North America. 
in the way that they're working. Um, and just sort of as an indication of sort of the direction of where we're going right now, uh, this is, uh, as part of the Groundworks project, we were doing some work on Alcatraz, and uh, so we did a VR shoot of uh, a performance there, which I'm not gonna talk too much about because it will come up during uh, our panel right after lunch as well. So we've, um, we've really cut down on our level of ambition. Uh, after that project, reeling those out as little work. No, we're to, what we're trying to do ultimately is trying to make things, um, like trying to understand this way of working and uh, trying to uh, introduce people together. So the outputs of what we hope that this project will offer are uh, an open source script library um, that will allow somebody to do the mapping and then also the framework for how to um, start up creating their own bespoke applications as well. And then looking at the different media types and how those get integrated in the different ways we take, um, we're able to use the data in people's phone. A lot of our projects are rooted in the idea that we want them to be accessible as possible. So you'll see a lot of our stuff tends to be focused on mobile because people tend to have mobile devices as opposed to um, more single use hardware. I just wanted to say how grateful I am that you all are here today to join us to talk through these questions and talk about these projects and that we are also very grateful for the funding from the Canada Council for the Arts um, for our digital strategy fund, uh, which will take us through these two years and the six symposia that we're gonna be hosting. And we're grateful for York University and Sensorium for hosting us today. Um, we hope that everyone has a great day and that you are free to come and go as you please. Um, this is just as by way of housekeeping. Um, and tell your friends is not too late. We're here till five. Um, and we really hope it's that nice you have a great day and you feel free to ask questions. It is, as we are clearly expressing, meant to be a casual conversation day, as Ian said, even though we're in the formal space. And so if you all have any questions for us before we take a quick coffee break, um, please let us know. Otherwise, you can find us in the lobby too. Yeah. Share the live stream link, please. Yes, the live stream link. <laughs> you can find it yes, on HowlRound.com, yeah. on our website at toasterlab.com slash atelier slash York, or uh, on our Facebook page yeah, sure. at slash MR Toaster Lab, or yeah. Mr. Toaster Lab. And we're recording it as well, and um, hoping to share at least a summary and the recording um, later on. Yeah, and that will be true for all of the symposia moving forward, which will take on different forms. Some of them will be formal like this, others will be more sort of hackathons within other larger uh, infrastructure, asking key questions. Uh, but we'll have more information about that at the, at the closing as well. So our next session will start at 11 o'clock, um, and it's focused on social ghosts. At 12 o'clock, we're gonna have a lunch break, and the space will need to be cleared. That will be on your own, and if you do need recommendations for where to go for lunch, um, we will help point you the way while in the lobby to lunch options. We'll reconvene at 1.30, have a short break at 3, 3.15 again, and then we'll close the day at around five o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>